Jack Chelman of the Global Returns Project. A warm welcome to the Humans versus Retirement podcast. Thank you very much, Dan. Delighted to be here. Jack, I can't wait to have this conversation. We've uh, had a few conversations leading up to this. I absolutely love what you guys are doing at the Global Returns Project. It's something that we as financial planners and our, and, and our financial planning business are uh, looking seriously at um, uh, to, 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 to offer a way of giving back to something really meaningful for, for our clients. So I can't wait to have this, this conversation with you, both about charitable giving in general and the great stuff that you guys at the Global Returns Project are doing. Fantastic. Well, really, really excited to get into it. So, Jack, I'm really curious. You've spent um, your career in this. So I, I want to understand a bit from you kind of how you've got to where you've got to um, and a little bit about the Global Returns Project in general. Um, and then I'm sure we'd, we'd dig deeper into everything as we as we go through the, the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just, you know, let's start from the top. Um, the the Global Returns Project is a UK charity ourselves. And what we're trying to do really simply is make it as easy as possible for any individual to give charitably to the best climate charities in the world. Um, and the thinking behind that is, of course, that we've got six years really to do as much as we possibly can to mitigate climate change. That's what scientists tell us. That's this concept of the decisive decade, 2020 to 2030. And in that time frame, you know, we've got to move as, as quickly as we can. And that sort of narrows our focus to what really matters. And I think, you know, you sort of mentioned how I got into this. I think that's sort of my path to the Global Returns Project. I um, I came over to the UK on a, on a two-year Marshall Scholarship, which let me do postgrad over here, which was great. And like everybody, I was, you know, I sort of was worried about climate change. It was an anxiety that was just sort of under everything that I was doing. And what I found that I liked about this approach from the Global Returns Project, which was just launching when I when I joined, um, was the idea that it, it matters and that you can deliver impact that is identifiable and fast, that is, you know, truly meaningful for the planet. And of course, we'll get into why it's meaningful and, and all that. But, you know, to wrap up what, what we're doing at the Global Returns Project, we, as I said, try and make all this charitable giving easy in the way we do that is we have put together a diverse selection of some of the very best climate charities in the world. We monitor them, we report on them, and we make it really easy for anybody to donate to them via the Global Returns Project. And it's such a, I think it's such an amazing initiative, one that is really unique in, in how it's structured and the, and the mechanics of the project, which I'm really interested in getting into, because I know many of the listeners will be um, as concerned as you about the climate crisis and probably are thinking about, well, if, if I feel like giving is part of my retirement plan, how can I give to things and causes that worry me, that are meaningful to me? And I think the, the giving into charities has often been something that is shied away from because the avenues to do so are, are, are really challenging. And that's what I love about what what you've done you, you've made as you said you've made those avenues re really seamless um i do want to i do want to start at the top with, with you though jack you, you're from washington dc um and, and in america i do know and that i've got many um americans that that listen to this podcast but but america much more so than the uk has um philanthropic giving and philanthropy more at the heart of uh, retirement or financial plans in general. So I'm really interested uh, over your journey and and also um, the work you're doing with Global Returns Project and the inroads you're making into the financial planning community in the UK, as well as the public. Talk to me about your views on charitable giving as part of a retirement plan. What does that mean and why should people can consider it? Absolutely. I think the clarifying part of charitable giving what i what i find 
so such a relief about it is it's simple, right? I mean, we're in a world where we all want to do something positive in, in all sorts of areas, right? On, on health, on human rights, on gender equity, on climate. And the avenues by which we can take action in those spheres are complicated, right? There's, there's obviously lots of things we need to be doing on lots of different fronts. There's no silver bullet solution to anything. But what I like about charitable giving is when you find a great charitable organization that's, that's you know, doing good work, that's been around a while, it's sort of proven its model, giving to that organization can deliver impact in a clear way, as I said, in a, in a short time frame, and it and it really matters. And I think, you know, just sort of zooming out to how this all fits in with perhaps retirement planning and what people want to do with the assets that they've worked really hard to accumulate over their their work period. You know, I think as, as of August this this past year, something like sixty four percent of adults in this country were worried about climate change. And people in the UK ranked climate and the environment as the joint third biggest issue facing the country at that time. So there's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of concern about climate change, of course. And we already see that people are starting to connect that to decisions they make about what to do with their assets. So I think in, in September, about 70% of respondents to a survey done by UK SIF, the Sustainable Investing and, and, and Finance Association, said that they'd be uncomfortable if their money was going into companies that were having a negative impact on climate and the environment. But I think our sort of question and, and what animates me is, if people want to avoid a negative impact, well, the, the flip side of that is, how do you help them deliver a positive impact? And if that's the question, charitable giving is a clear way. You don't have to worry about issues of greenwash. You don't have to wonder, you know, whether things are really being done because it can be very, very clear. And of course, we'll, we'll get into more of that. Mm. A couple of really interesting points that links into some conversations I've had on the podcast over the uh, uh, previously. We know that giving away our time and money makes us happy. That that's baked in science. They've done you know numerous studies on the human brain around uh, what giving does to us and 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 the types of chemicals that it produces and and how it makes us feel. So, I think it's interesting that many people do see um, a, a way of giving back as part of their retirement plan. I think people have struggled to, to understand how to give back. And, and I think what's happened is that there's a couple of things in my mind. I want to get your take on this. I think one, one of those is that people believe that the act of giving is for people with lots of money, which I want to talk to you and dispel that myth straight, straight away. Um, and also, I think there's a lot of, you mentioned greenwashing, there's a, there's a lot of press and negativity around uh, ESG and impact investing. And, and I think people have thought, well, that's, that's one of the only ways I can do this. I, I have to kind of take the assets that I've got, I have to invest them in an ESG or impact fund. And actually, I don't really truly understand what's going on. And I don't, it doesn't actually fit fully in with, with my values. And as you said, the, the stats are overwhelmingly in favor that people are more worried about the climate crisis than most, most other things. And they're acting, right? Whether we believe electric cars solves the issue or not, you know, you can see how people are actually spending their assets now. They're spending them in a way that is um, aligned to kind of their views about trying to, you know, trying to not add to the problem. So just a couple of things there, Jack, with you. Um, it's not an act for the rich, number one, right? And also, the great thing here is that we're not talking about a minefield of ESG things that you have to understand before you, before you go into them. Absolutely. I mean, just picking up on a couple of those points, Dan, I think, you know, there's this question of, well, we know that people feel good when they engage in charitable giving. Well, why aren't they? I think part of our probable, probably our answer to that would be that 
there's a certain you know let's let's think from a from a financial planning perspective or a um you know that sort of mindset when someone is thinking about what to do with their money there's a certain rigor that gives people comfort right and that makes them feel that they're making the right decision and i think we think about that as as analogous to fund management right when you're when you're dealing with investing when it, when a fund manager is putting together an investment product you know there are certain principles that you just take for granted you want a diversified portfolio of of things to invest in you want somebody to be doing rigorous research to put it together and you expect some reporting right you need to know what's going on in the long term and and on a regular basis and those are all so standard in investing but for whatever reason in charitable giving, a lot of those principles sort of fall by the wayside. And certainly, mm -hmm. they're pretty rare altogether. Mm -hmm. And I think that would be my first answer to why people sometimes hesitate to be philanthropic is because there's not that rigor. And that's what we really try to put forward. So we, we say when we have this group of charities that we've selected, we say it's sort of like a fund management approach to climate philanthropy. Now, this group of charities isn't a, it's not an investment fund. It doesn't deliver any returns. It's something that you donate to philanthropically. But within that idea, we're saying it has those principles of rigor that make a donor feel comfortable. And the other element of what you said, I think fits in well too, which is this idea that, you know, you have to be a billionaire or, or, or a mega millionaire to be philanthropic. And we know that actually what's incredible about giving to charity is that even small amounts relative to all the money that's sloshing around out there in the world, even small amounts really matter. And we can really track what they do in a big way. And again, if you sort of put that, that investing hat on or treat charitable giving like an asset allocation decision, then actually giving something relatively small becomes actually sort of normal, right? I mean, we often talk with our donors about starting with a, a donation on an annual basis of somewhere between 0.25% and 1% of their savings and investments. And of course, for a lot of people, that's not something that they will feel on a sort of day-to-day -day basis. But if everybody did that, that would matter hugely. So it's just, you know, in the same way that you sort of put a couple basis points into certain different things when you're investing, you can do the same with charitable giving and it matters. I think it's such an interesting point and concept. I just want to re I want to repeat what you said. Making charitable giving part of your asset allocation. It's a wonderful way to view it. It's a wonderful way to go I'll make something up here. Uh, I've got 60% in equities. I've got 35% in fixed interest. And I've got 5% in charitable donations. Exactly. And if we start thinking like that, because that now there's mechanics to be able to think like that and do that. And as you said, actually, the 5% is now going to be reported on in a way that is very similar to the other 95%. And one of the reasons I believe that that people don't give as much as what they should is because they don't see the impact. They believe their, again, I'll make a number up, their £5,000 a year going into these big charities, is they don't see the impact that, that that is truly given. I think that's why maybe some charitable giving has gone quite local over the last couple of years, because it's, I'd rather give... Two hundred and fifty pounds to a, a a local charity that I can actually go and see because it's the, you know, it's the thing down the road from me. Rather than, and that's one of the things I love about what you're doing. You, you're so transparent in the charities that you select, and every little bit counts because you report on the impact that those charities are having. And I think that mindset needs to come into this. If you've got real concerns about climate crisis there is now an unbelievable way to be able to allocate part of your portfolio to be able to give to those charities and understand truly the impact that your gift no matter how big or small that is having absolutely i mean 
you talk about high impact. We describe the charities that we select as being sort of blue chip equivalents in the climate charity space. And what that means for us is the charities we recommend, there's six in this group of charities that we recommend. All six we say are high impact because they're all scalable, they're best in class in their particular sector from all around the world, operating in dozens of countries, but they're low risk from a philanthropic perspective because they've all been screened for strong governance and it's a diversified selection within the context of charitable giving. So it's not thousands of charities like you might have for a, for a sort of typical fund, but it's a lot more charities than you would sort of think about if you were just trying to go about this on your own. Mm. And of course, we've got a team of world-class climate scientists who help oversee the selection and assessment of these charities. We have our own proprietary methodology for doing all this due diligence. We, we might dig into that a little later, but you know the basics of that are if we're looking at a charity, it has to pass a series of governance and sizing gates first, then we score it according to that rigorous methodology. And we want to make sure that it has high impact, high scalability, it's delivering co-benefits, et cetera. So that's, that's how we feel comfortable recommending the charities that we do, because they've all gone through this incredibly rigorous process. And it might just be worth sort of saying how this actually works for somebody who's who's doing it, who actually you know donates. I mean, I think the first thing that that happens if somebody says, "Great, this sounds good. I'd like to give something this year," and there's no minimum, so it could be you know a small monthly donation or it could be a larger annual donation. First thing they do is decide if they want to support all the charities we select or. A, a more bespoke selection. The standard donation gets split equally among the six charities we recommend. But if a donor wants to support a couple of them or one of them, they can approach us about that. That's absolutely fine. Once they make that decision, they donate to the Global Returns Project, and we distribute 100% of that donation to the charities they want to support without any deductions whatsoever. And that is not a common model. The reason we have that model is that our core costs as, a, as an organization, as the Global Returns Project, are funded entirely separately by our trustees and a number of charitable trusts, foundations, and some individual supporters. So that means we're not taking anything off the top. And in fact, we absorb all the transaction fees of donations. So it truly is 100% through. We distribute to the charities. And then after that, you were talking about reporting, Dan, and that's really where the fun part comes in for the donors, because we do our six monthly impact reporting that is only available to our donors uh, on an annual basis that's personalized to be even more specific to exactly what a, a particular individual has given that year and what they've what they've delivered with their with their contributions. And then we also invite donors who are in the UK and around the London area to quite a few in-person events. And that's a nice opportunity to meet our experts, our scientists, and lots of other interesting people. Your point around, and I'll touch on a couple of them, the 100% the donation is, is rare, as you know, you've worked in this space. But, but also, it's really important for people to understand that these, these are you know, they're true, you know, not-for-profit charities. One of the things that people um, wrestle with, I believe, when it comes to their giving is that is it is it profits over people? So am I putting something in here that actually the, the, the charity or the investment fund that says it does impact or ESG, if even one of their things is profitability it it goes against actually a lot of what they're trying to to achieve so i think that's the beauty of the of the global returns project it is the way it's structured uh, around that people have the utmost confidence that every penny they donate goes directly to the charities and those charities every penny that they get it, it, you know goes directly into the running of 
the thing they're doing and the research they're doing and the court, you know, the causes there. So I believe that's a really important point to, to, to drag out. Absolutely. And maybe it's worth, you, you mentioned impact funds or sustainable investing, you know, generally, of course, within that asset allocation mindset, if someone is thinking about how to deliver something positive with their money, the first thing they think about is probably an ESG strategy or perhaps a sustainable strategy, maybe even impact funds, as you said. Now, that is really important, right? We have to make sustainable investing normal, needs to be the mainstream. And it's fantastic that so many investors are already going to, to funds like these. I think our perspective on sustainable investing is it's, it's important, but it's not enough on its own. And the risk perhaps with the rise of ESG and sustainable investing is that it, it can make someone feel that it's all they need to do. That if they just switch all their assets to sustainable funds, then they're making a return and they're doing everything they need to do for the planet. There's, there's two problems with that, unfortunately. Number one, of course, we all see the headlines. We know that sustainable funds often have work to do, right? They're not always delivering all the solutions that they want to be delivering. And there's a lot of good intention out there, but it takes time to work out how to fulfill promises that, a, that an investment product is, is making. So that's sort of the, the first one is greenwash is an issue. And we just don't have the time to wait around for it to be fixed, right? It's going to take years to get all this ironed out. And we've only got six years to do as much as we possibly can. The other problem with sustainable investing is it just doesn't do enough on its own. And the reality is, if you think about all the things that we need to do for the planet, quite a few things that are really important struggle to deliver financial returns. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm thinking about things like the enforcement of environmental law, which we know is an incredibly powerful lever to pull for holding governments to account, corporates to account, training environmental lawyers to enforce legislation. It's really hard to invest in, you know, environmental lawyers. It's, it's, it's pretty much impossible, right? That's not something that's financializable. And there are lots of things like that. Um, setting up marine protected areas in the oceans, um, delivering data tools to shine a light on deforestation in supply chains, um, certain types of rainforest protection, reforestation efforts. Some of these things may be on the margins. You could, you could try and fit into an investment product, but on the whole, as I said, they're not financializable. And so from the perspective of a sustainable fund, they don't exist, right? Those funds mm. can't get to those things. Mm. And so what we say, sort of bringing it all back to charitable giving, the power of a climate charity is that it can do those things that don't deliver financial returns. And so our, you know, our ideal model is that somebody is investing sustainably and, and taking that really seriously, but also giving something on a monthly or annual basis to high impact climate charities. And in that way, they're sort of covering all their bases. Mm. It's so important to recognize that. And, and not just people that are thinking about, you know, building this into their plans, but, but just everybody in general, the, the, the mechanics of being able to get the money in the hands of the people that can have the biggest impact on the things that you mentioned, um, you know, rainforests, environmental law, ocean, trees, all, all the stuff that we know that I believe it's almost impossible to have a view other than it's a, it, it's a straight gift. It, we, it, we know the world gets messy when we start trying to make a profit out of things, when things start to have to have a, a return mechanism, um, the greed comes in and, and, the, and, and the actual impact goes down, in, in my view. So I think it's so important that you, that, that you identify 
those things. So let's just jump on that because, you know, your portfolio of charities are, um, are, are phenomenal. And, and as you said, you've, you know, you, you've got a global canopy, which um, is using data to fight nature loss, the rainforest trust um, to protect the, the rainforest client earth, which is um, using law to defend nature and enforcing environmental law. Is it WDC, which is saving carbon um, and, and a kind of whales and dolphins uh, con- right. um, co- conservation. Uh, the Blue Marine Foundation. I mean, people are so – people are. I, I don't think there's a topic. Uh, the, the ocean seems to cause a lot of emotion. There's a poem in there somewhere, um, <laughs> yeah, it, it, yeah. but but it does, right? I mean, we you know, I think we we get totally. really when when we see the ocean and we see all of the plastic and the pollution waste and the coastline going and all of that. I mean, that's that's hugely and trillion trees about high quality tree planting. You know, the, the, these are charities that are making such a difference that require as much as they possibly can, and every penny helps. I'd, I'd love to just get your thought on. We don't. We can go through them all. We've got time, but. <laughs> you know, what those charities mean and why some of them were selected and, and, and how, as you said, building on, on what you talked about around if this was a, right, these, these charities need to run like businesses and create a profit, th- their impact would just fall off a cliff, right? Totally. Um, I mean, you, you asked why, why these particular charities. I think for us, there's probably two things really to highlight. Number one, successes. And number two, the diversity of the charity. So I'll just touch on on both of those. Now, I mean, just on the first, these charities are doing incredible work. And that's the bottom line is that they have a proven track record of actually delivering results. And they're not treading water, right? The more funding they get, the more results they can deliver. And, and not all sort of blue chip equivalent organizations are doing that, right? So we are absolutely filtering down. Let's just go through a couple successes. I mean, you mentioned Blue Marine Foundation. They do ocean conservation. Uh, They've helped protect 4.3 million square kilometers of the ocean surface to date. Client Earth is a team of environmental lawyers using the law to hold governments and corporates to account and deliver incredible wins. They have 168 active cases all around the world in over 50 countries, and they have a 74% litigation success rate in in all of that. Um, Global Canopy, as you said, uh, shining a light on deforestation in supply chains, which is incredibly important for giving people the data we need to take action. One of the interesting things they've done with that, that data is they're one of the co-founders of the task force for nature-related financial disclosures, which is a coalition of big financial institutions all around the world who are taking nature loss really seriously because of this effort. And there's the, the partners of that initiative already represent over $20 trillion in assets under management. Rainforest Trust buys up and protects areas of threatened rainforest around the world. They've done that with 45 million acres to date, and 99% of the rainforest they've protected since 1988 is still protected today. So an incredible track record. Trillion Trees is forest restoration, so it's sort of a nice compliment if Rainforest Trust is protecting threatened rainforest. Trillion Trees is going in and rejuvenating forest that's been degraded, and they've got over 200,000 hectares of forest because of their unique model that's just ready to be restored if they get the proper funding. It's, they, they've got all the partnerships in place. And then WDC, Whale and Dolphin Conservation, some listeners may not know that whales play this really interesting and important role in ocean carbon cycles. They help fertilize phytoplankton, which are some of the most important uh, photosynthesizers and thereby sequesters of carbon in the world. Um, and and one of the many interesting things WDC does is they identify important marine mammal areas, IMMAs, all over the world. Once they do that, those areas are recognized by international bodies like the Whaling Commission and others. They've, to do that, 
analyzed over two thirds of the ocean's surface already, and they've identified over 250 IMMAs so far. So that, that's just a, a quick sort of taste of some of the things that these organizations are doing. The other side of, of what I said, so successes is one reason we recommend them. The other is diversity. And again, let's put our, our asset allocation hat back on, our investment hat back on. Again, you would never, in thinking about your assets, you would never put all your money into one company, right? That's like Dan would stop anybody, you'd yeah. stop that, that right away. But for whatever reason, you know, in charitable giving, that's, that's you know, what we mostly do. We pick one mm -hmm. charity in one space and we go with that for most of our lives. Um, for us, that, that doesn't make so much sense. And it's also a challenge for the climate crisis where so many different things need to be done. Mm -hmm. So what we've done as the Global Returns Project is we've worked with our scientists and we've done a lot of research to set out a full, we call it the full opportunity set for climate charities, the full list of intervention areas that this kind of organization can engage in. And it's a long, long list. Every six months, we compare the activities of the current portfolio with that full opportunity set. And we report that as a percentage figure. We call it our portfolio diversity figure. So at the moment, it's something like 63%. That means we're nearly hitting two thirds of the total activities that we could be hitting. Mm -hmm. And that's really interesting in the short term, of course, because we can report on that. We can break it down by, by sector, by SDG, et cetera. But that is also what guides our additions to the portfolio and our monitoring of the portfolio as well. Our goal is to make sure that we're hitting 100% eventually of those areas. And that, I think for our donors, that sort of structure of knowing that we're not just flailing around in the dark, that we've got a strategy for why each organization is here and the, the activities it's engaged in sort of mattering for a broader strategy that gives people a lot of comfort. Here's the link for me, right? We know that, and one thing I love that you, that you said, and, and I want to bring it back out, the more money these charities have, the more work they can do. This is not a, they're not at capacity. They're not going to swallow up the funds into hiring new board members. The more money they have, the more real work they can do, number one. Link that to the fact that many retire, you know, the, the assets, the money in um, public, in people, is sitting with people that are approaching retirement in general. And we know, and I've mentioned this on several other podcast episodes, we know that on average, the average retiree leaves about 70% of their net wealth on the table when they die. So we know that the, there's a huge amount of money that just doesn't get spent. Now, I'm all for living life. I've said many times before, we want to make sure that we spend our money on what's most important to us with the people we want to. But actually, a big part of that might be giving back, right? It might right. be giving back and should be, I think. So the link here is that you've got charities that will do, the more you give them, the more they can do to causes that we know have a massive impact on the thing that is probably um, puts us, our planet, uh, 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 at the most danger. And we know there's a bunch of people over here that are never going to spend their money. Now this is about, the link is about trying to make sure we can link this through and bring that to life for people, knowing that, again, it doesn't have to be hundreds of thousands of pounds. There's a way that you can give regularly during your lifetime, and there's a way that you can leave stuff at the end of your life. And um, In the show notes, I'm going to link a um, – I've created a, a gifting and legacy worksheet that I, I think will just help people start to narrow down who and what is most important to them and how they believe they can give back. And – I think we just need to realize that link. Once we realize that there's a lot of money left on the table and there's a way that we can now distribute that money into charities that the more money they have, the more work they can do. I think that's, that's such an important area to bring out. Totally. Uh, I mean, 
one question we get fairly often is even if someone's made a decision to be charitable and, and often as you say dan that decision gets made around legacies or around what to do it as they as they retire you know the, the decision to be charitable first of all it, it is incredibly important and makes us happy right but within that why climate mitigation mm. um i think there's there's a couple points that that come up here number one often the charitable giving that we think about for if you say what well, would you like to give something to charity the first thing that comes to mind is probably something social mm. right incredibly important things like tackling homelessness tackling issues of health in developing countries human rights all of these things that often they start with people mm -hmm. um but they can expand to other areas beyond the environment but but that aren't environmental and there's no competing with these things that are you know massively important for the people and issues we care about the challenge is the climate crisis exists right and it's not going away it's getting much much worse actually and if we don't deal with it now especially in this in this critical window we have before 2030 we're not going to be able to deal with poverty or human rights or health or any of the other things we we want to deal with the reality is climate change you know warming on a global scale makes everything else so much worse so so that's the first reason to do this and even if you're already charitable for for things that matter to you maybe there are local organizations that you're already giving to finding a way to give to these high impact climate charities as well is basically the missing puzzle piece from our perspective in your charitable giving the other side of it is these organizations need the funding um there's this incredibly striking statistic which comes from the climate works foundation they do a report every year where they do a huge mapping exercise of global philanthropy and all the philanthropic giving that goes on around the world and for four years in a row, all four years that they've done this report, the, the amount of philanthropy that goes to climate mitigation efforts has never gotten above 2% of charitable giving. And it's just not enough. It, it's just not enough. It, you know, we don't need to be giving everything to climate charities, but if we don't crack that 2% barrier, we are never gonna be able to deal with this issue that makes all the other issues we care about worse. And that's the beauty of what you're doing. P people, I believe, haven't, although it's a, I think it's become more real, hasn't it? I, you can often get your, as you said, you can walk down the street and you can see homeless people and it becomes more emotive. I think many people have batted away the climate crisis going, oh, it's not, you know, it, it doesn't feel real. But then you have the winters and the summers globally and, and and you can see how the weather has changed and you can and, and then you can you know you can see how sp animal species are are declining you can see how the oceans are doing you can see how you know and it's more in our face so i feel i think it believe i believe it's more real than it's ever been for people couple that with as we said before that there hasn't been a mechanism for people to i think comfortably part with their money in a exactly. way that they believe it's going to make an impact well that's changed with you guys so that's the thing we need to do that 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 missing link and you know less than two percent is giving to the thing that is potentially as most important and you know everything is depend on our views and our philosophy and i'm not trying to kind of say change people's minds here but as you said, if, if you don't tackle that, then the stuff around homelessness and all of that stuff, it could be irrelevant because, it, it, it you know, the foundational stuff that the earth needs to, to carry on and do things is, 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 is potentially at risk. So um, I, I just want to spend, before we wrap up, I, I, and, and I'm going to give you an opportunity to tell people where they can go and, and how they can um look at this further and, and all of the links to the global returns project your website is brilliant it okay. breaks everything down you can link um, you can donate straight through the website 
and we'll talk about actually how we could start integrating that into the work that we as financial planners do in a second. But um, just just talk to me a, a little bit about the mechanics and the methodology of 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 the project. You have um, you've mentioned it a, 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 a little bit, but you know you screen thousands of charities for governance. You score them. Um, you know you've got a team, in, and I think. A, one one of the things I want you to kind of mention here is the the team of world class global scientists that you guys have. It's, I mean, I'm just looking at them. They've got more letters after the name than I've actually got letters <laughs> in my name, which is really cool. Um, but yeah, just just talk to me a little bit for the next couple of minutes about the mechanics and what that looks like, and just hammer home to people listening. If if you know if you've, you've whetted their appetite, what does it actually mean? Sure. I mean, it's one of the things that I think is is best about our model is that it's such a rigorous methodology. So, as you said, we've put over 20,000 organizations through at least the initial stages of our methodology to screen organizations out. Uh, we've whittled that down to six that we've selected, and that gives people a, a huge amount of peace of mind. Let's just Think, for example, if we're looking at a climate charity and thinking about adding it to this portfolio of recommended organizations that we have, if we're doing that, the first thing that has to happen with that organization is it needs to pass a series of governance and sizing gates, which we've talked a little bit about, but that essentially means that it becomes, you know, or that we filter out any organizations that aren't blue chip equivalents. So they need to be a certain size, age, income threshold. Etc. And just a, a tangent there. Of course, there's huge value to local organizations, to your your very very small uh, river cleanup organization or local tree planting group. Why blue chip equivalents? Well, number one, for peace of mind, but number two, because we've only got six years, and if we're if if we're going to allocate our capital to the places that matter the most. These global organizations that are innovating, pushing the envelope, and delivering tangible successes are the best possible place for our funds to go. So that's that's why it's blue chip equivalents. Once we do those governance and sizing gates, then we score an organization that makes it through according to the rest of our methodology. So we assess them by their impact, the scalability of their operations, the networks they formed and the co-benefits they deliver. And of course, there's a huge amount that goes into that, you know, impact. We take a principles-based approach. We look at peer comparisons of similar organizations, the longevity, the permanence of their activities, cost-effectiveness estimates for, for scalability. We look at whether the marginal cost of their activities decreases as the scope of those activities increases. And it goes on and on, of course. So it's a, it's a really detailed process. We tend to go sector by sector. And the highest scoring organization in a particular sector, according to our methodology, is what gets admitted to our group of charities. And then I think the, the, the part that donors really like is that's not the end of the story for us. So as I've said, every six months, we provide our own detailed impact reporting to all our donors. That is also an opportunity for us to rescore all the organizations in the portfolio, which we do on a six month basis using that original methodology. If we find that a group is underperforming, according to our metrics, we will consider removing them and replacing them with a higher performing group. And that, again, is that element of monitoring peace of mind for donors that the organizations we recommend will always be best in class, according to our process. And that's, that's really how it works. And, and, and I think if I can just sort of tag on one, one other question that I often get asked by people who are thinking about this, the, the question is, well, why would I donate through the Global Returns Project rather than just giving directly to these organizations, right? Good question. Uh, yeah. And I, the first thing I say is always, well, we, we mostly we just want you to donate, right? Mm. But the reason that people choose to give through us, I think there's really, there's three elements to it. Number one, you're not losing anything by working through us. So as I've said, we don't take any cut off the top, 100% of your donation goes through. 
if you would like to be introduced directly to the charities and have a direct relationship with them as well. We do that all the time. Often larger donors, people who are, are giving larger sums of money, want to have those direct relationships, want to give strategic advice to the CEOs and go to their events. And that's something we do quite frequently, but you still get our relationship, our monitoring, et cetera. So you're not losing anything. Number two, you're gaining quite a bit because we're doing our impact reporting. You know that we're monitoring, we're making sure organizations are best in class and you can come to our events, all, all the rest of the good stuff. The third thing, and, I, and actually I think the thing that our donors care about maybe most of all is essentially by working through us, you're getting a bit of extra impact. And what I mean by that is, even though we're not taking anything from donations, everything that comes via the Global Returns Project essentially helps us make a stronger and stronger case to other individuals, financial institutions, corporates, to do exactly the same. Because the more we raise through us, the stronger case we have for making this normal for everyone. And so essentially, there's an element of creating collective leverage by working through us. So how can people work through you? It, it's a super easy process. You've got a, a big orange donate button <laughs> on your website, which people can, you know, set up direct debits, make one-off contribution. There's obviously gift aid available in the UK. Um, can people donate if they live elsewhere? Can they, or is this purely U UK? No, they can donate from anywhere. Um, so the, the process, as you've said, is really, really simple. Donations can be done anytime on our website. Um, do click that, that big orange button. Um, and it can be, as you said, a direct debit, a one-off, et cetera. If someone is eligible for gift aid, we give you the option of giving that gift aid either to the charities, the, the portfolio of six, which you're welcome to do, or we give you the option of giving that gift aid to our core costs as the Global Returns Project, something like 80% of donors end up doing that because it's really, really helpful for us to be able to keep up our monitoring and reporting, but it's not yeah. required. So yeah. that's, that's just an option part of that. Um, there's also a place where you can say where you came from. So you can say you, you're, you're one of Dan's and you can, that, that helps us with reporting as well. But donations on our website, or if you'd like to get in touch with us, we can provide bank details. And for some, that's easier often for larger donations as well. Um, so my email is jack at globalreturnsproject.earth. And we're pretty accessible in that way. We have lots and lots of donors in the UK, but but people giving from, from Singapore, from the US, from all sorts of places. And, you know, we really want this to be easy and normal wherever it can be. Mm. And I love the work that you've been doing to try and integrate yourself into the financial planning community in, in, in the UK. You've, you've linked the Global Returns Project to um, platforms, i.e. the places where, you, where, where financial advisors help their clients invest their money into products. The ability for us to now execute this um, in line with a, a particular client's wishes and values in an asset allocation decision way now is is there because we can now go well your pensions and your ISAs and your investments are sitting here and actually through that platform we've got access to the global returns project and we can make a an asset allocation call of a regular gift or a lump sum or ad hoc lump sum so that work in integrating the global returns project is phenomenal. I don't know you're really you're really making strides with some big financial planners in the UK, and that's something that we're talking about with you to to integrate it into what we have available for for for, for, for our clients. Totally. Um, and the last thing I'd say as well, Dan, is yeah. there's no there's no minimum contribution either. So we have no. you know quite a few people who set up something, see see how it goes, see if they like the reporting. Yeah and then increase it as it as it goes on. So that's also an option. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, all of that is going to be linked to the website, your email address, um, and, and those specific things. It's, you know, as I said, the website's so powerful that the brochures are great, the imagery is amazing, you've got videos, you've got the ability to really dig deep. And if you need to dig deeper, 
obviously Jack's at, at the end of his email address for you to for you to call. So uh, for you to, to speak to. Yeah, I, I think it's just such a it's a concept that we need to get our our head around. So I, I really just want to thank you for taking time to explain it. I know it's going to add so much value. It's going to be really thought provoking for a lot of the listeners that I know that as they start to plan their retirement, they are absolutely thinking about how to allocate their capital in line with their values and their wishes. And more people's values and wishes are leaning down a way to be able to give back to charities and things that are really close to 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 them um so thank you jack for 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 coming on for coming on and talking about this it's and thank you for the work you're doing and um yeah and, and uh, i really appreciate you detailing everything about the global returns project well thank you so much dan i mean we're all i think we're all wondering what we can do about climate change and what's amazing is this really works so i um, mean it's amazing to to talk with you and it's amazing to talk with people all around the UK who have some assets and want to do something meaningful with them because if we all do something then we can really move the dial on the issue amazing thank you so much and that just leads me to thank everybody for listening in to the humans versus retirement podcast it's been a pleasure to have you with us today until next time everybody take care